We've done a very good job with the IT Pro community. In terms of the developer community, I think we've given them a great value proposition, but not enough developers uh, are using PowerShell on a continual basis. So what we're going to do is we are going to focus in, so this is the futures part, <laughs> so we're going to develop more and more, uh, focus more onto the developer scenarios. I always wanted to have a wide dynamic language which was going to support both admins and developers. Um, and we need to, we've had that for a while, we need to make it even more friendly to developers. So uh, unfortunately Bruce Payette un, un, uh, accidentally disclosed uh, a week or so ago the fact that in the next release, uh, in, in July, we're going to be supporting classes in PowerShell. Okay. Um, so in the classes, we'll have a new language mode. And in this language mode, it'll be much more friendly to developers. You'll like it too, but much more friendly to developers. Uh, for instance, if you, you, if you have a method and you're going to return something, you don't use write output anymore. Uh, you use return. And then anything that you do to write output, either intentionally or accidentally, like you ever do that? You write a function and you got a return statement. But one of your lines calls a method, and that method like returns an object. So it got included in your return statement. Anybody who's been scripting has run into this. It's just horrible. Um, that problem goes away with this new language mode. You must use a return statement. You must declare your return type, uh, and, then, and then it works. Additionally, in that new language mode, we get rid of dynamic typing and just have lexical typing. So these are the things that developers like. We think they're going to like it a lot. I mentioned the OData. And we're going to focus very heavily on DevOps scenarios. So you've heard that we're, I'm putting all the bets on desired state configuration. In fact, that's a proxy for the real statement. The real statement is, I'm putting all our effort into our partnership with Visual Studio. Visual Studio bought a product last year called InRelease. It does, um, sort of supports a DevOps workflow for continuous deployment where developers in Visual Studio are able to say, hey, I wrote some code, I want to manage that code, I want to run it in my development environment, I want to hand it off to somebody who runs it in their test environment, and then hand it to somebody who runs in their production environment. And so you'll be able to go and write uh, desired state configuration scripts in your Visual Studio project. You use desired state configuration to set up and run your software in those other environments. So there's just a huge focus in on the developer scenarios. Now, if you're an IT pro, don't worry about that. This is all goodness. First, you got yours, so give it a break. But the second is that once I get these developers using more and more using PowerShell, uh, they're going to produce the two things. One is they're going to produce artifacts that are better in line with what you need. And two is they're going to produce that long tail. I think we We've done a good job of getting the critical mass of, of commandlets, but there's an infinitely long tail of the little things that need to get done. Developers are the guys that are going to write that long tail. So getting them in the boat and making them active users, uh, they will write that long tail for us. So it's a good deal. And then you guys, uh, I need you to have, give more direct feedback to the teams. Now, never before has it been more important for you to engage with the Microsoft Teams, right? We got a new CEO in town, right? And the thing this CEO cares about more than anything is usage, 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 right? Not, hey, I licensed you some software that you're never going to use, but I got some money, yay. That's not the deal. He doesn't want that. He explicitly doesn't want that, right? Sales minus deployments equals liabilities. He wants deployments. He wants usage. He wants to know what it takes for you to be successful. That you use our products, you get our products, you use them, you use them a lot, you use them a lot, you use them a lot, you're successful and you love them. What's that take? And he's beaten everybody on that with that. And so the teams are very eager to hear what it takes to make you successful. So never before. If you've had some engagements in the past and the teams didn't listen as much as you'd like to, I encourage you to try it again. I think the percentage of times that'll be successful go up. Next year, it'll go up even higher as the folks that ignore you this year are going to get fired and be replaced by people who will listen to you. No, I'm really quite serious about that. It's uh, the, the new boss is quite serious about that, and it's wonderful, honestly. As engineers, we all love it. As engineers, what do we care about? We care about writing lots of code and having people use it. So we're just in heaven. 
All right, application testers, mixed success. Uh, the amount of code that, that got written and therefore got needed to be tested uh, reduced dramatically, but the things you could do with that code increased dramatically. So if you felt like you needed to test everything you could do, your test work actually went up. And in fact, that happened in a number of teams at Microsoft. Uh, induction is not a skill that Microsoft test engineers have, right? Okay, well, one plus one equals two, and two plus two equals four, but who the hell knows about this three plus three? You know, we couldn't, couldn't we're going to have to test all the damn integers, you know? <laughs> anyway, so induction is not a skill that they have. So anyway, some folks got this, some folks didn't. Um, Again, exchange layering on GUI was a big success, but in general, writing GUIs on top of PowerShell has been difficult. Again, part of this is the developer engagement. Uh, it's been difficult to write PowerShell in Visual Studio. Well, you haven't been able to. Now you can. Uh, and we still don't have crossed uh, language debugging, which is important for this scenario. Oh, and uh, we have not. Um, provided or supported a test framework. I expect that to change. I expect that to change pretty quickly. Uh, we're evaluating a community test framework and we'll probably endorse that and, uh, and contribute code to that. So that's uh, with the lawyers now. Um, but again, what we want to do is to reach out there and just move quickly, right? Work with the community, and move quickly. Uh, so we're reworking the test culture and uh, we're going to support public framework and have great integration between PowerShell and Visual Studio. So for administrators, it's successful when it's successful. Okay, or it's very successful when it's successful. A lot of the Linux admins, they just, you know, if you're a Linux admin and you got to go on Windows, uh, when you find PowerShell, you're like, oh, thank God. They just love PowerShell. Uh, and a number of them, right? So I say that there's three categories of, of Unix guys. Right? There's the, the, the communists, I mean, literally, the communists. Like Richard Stallman is literally a communist. And by the way, I'm not throwing a rocket at it. He'll tell you he's a communist. Or he's a, it's a political issue with them. Right? Free software is a political issue. Then there are people who are like the, you know, the, 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 uh, the zealots. You know? Hey, I'm a freshman in college. This is the only thing I know. What I do is great and everything else is crap and I'm going to throw monkey poop at it, right? And so they're the trolls on the internet, like la la la, MS is M dollar sign, and okay, they're just the idiots. Uh, but they're vocal idiots. But anyway, so they, they hate everything Microsoft does. But most Unix developers are people whose heads and hearts are in the right place, and we just haven't given them the tools that they needed to succeed. And so that's why they don't like Windows. And now we're giving them the tools they succeed. They actually like that. In fact, there's a great story about a company who, um, uh, okay, well, I'll give it this way. So they, 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 they saw their Unix company, but they also do Windows development, right? They support Windows. And uh, it was a managing company. And they, the, these developers got ahead of a hold of PowerShell, and they thought, hey, wait a second. And they went and exposed their global namespace as a drive, right? And so they'd CD into their drive into a dir and see all the servers. And then they did, wait a second, I can do a dir down all the Windows machines, and I can do, you know, st dir star windows uh, uh, slash SQL slash sys, you know, uh, uh, you know hotfix X, and they were able to find all the SQL servers that had a particular hotfix, or all the SQL servers that didn't. And they said, "Oh my God, this is the most powerful thing we've ever encountered." And they said, "They said they told me the story. They said we were drunk with enthusiasm. I mean, we were so enthusiastic. We thought, man, we got to get a sanity check here because this is just crazy." And so they brought it to Carl. Right? And I forget the guy's name, but <laughs> Carl. He said, they, he, this was our black belt Linux admin, right? He'd been doing this forever. He was a classic Unix admin, right? The beard with the crumbs in it and the suspenders. And anyway, so they said, Carl, we'd like some time with you. We'd like to show you a tool and, sh and get your opinion. And so they showed him the tool. And uh, at the end of the half hour, Carl said, yeah, it's good. Get me a Windows machine. And they didn't expect that at all. And they're like, what? You want? You want a Windows box? He says, yeah, give me a box. I want to, I want to use this tool. I'm like, wow, we never expected that. He says, you guys don't give it. Get it. He says, I don't give a shit about Linux. I don't give a shit about Windows. What I care about tools. Tools make me successful or tools keep me from being successful. What you just showed me is a great tool and I want it. And I have to put up with Windows to get it? Fine, I'll put up with Windows to get it. Give me that tool. Most Unix developers are like that. 
and we have not been giving them the right tools. And with PowerShell, we are. So they like it. Anyway, uh, the objects really have driven simplicity. That really works. Um, and the errors, that's great and horrible. Sometimes they're great, sometimes they're horrible. I think the fully qualified error ID, at, when used as a search term, has been very successful. I don't know, how many people use the fully qualified error ID as a search term? Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Oh, oh wait, so here. So let's see. So, Okay, so this is an error, but notice here this fully qualified error ID. The idea here is that you use this as a search term. Okay, so let me make this smaller so I can cut it correctly. Now, the rest of that error will get localized right, by different languages. But this fully qualified error ID never does. Uh, and neither does this category info, I think. But anyway, so the idea is that this is meant to be a unique identifier. So you copy that thing, and then you go over to your favorite browser. Go away, Joel. Oh, you know, I don't know if I have, let me see. Anyway, you just paste it into a browser, what? Pay no attention to that. Oh, God damn it. <laughs> Don't tell anyone. Tell no one. You do not see that. Anyway, so you, you paste that in, and then you get all sorts of great uh, content. And that's why I encourage you, whenever, you, whenever you're you know, discussing something or a problem you have, you paste the, that and the fully qualified error IDs in there, and then all the discussion about what went wrong, it makes it easy to find. So I think that's been a, been a huge success, although the lack of hands up makes me wonder whether that's correct or not. Anyway, so I, I encourage you to use that. It's been very, very successful with me. Uh, <laughs> Um, and again, the admin success depends on command like coverage. Um, but uh, the number of uh, Unix Windows admins that are really just click next is very large. And uh, they've been just immune to our s efforts to simplify things. And desired state configuration is their last hope. Like, I'm done investing in these guys, right? They're going to make it or they're not. And that's it. Now, let me say, be clear about that. This is a serious point on there. If, if, if you get a CD-ROM from a vendor, and, and you, if your skill set is the ability to put it in a reader and click next, 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 and call yourself an IT pro, I assert your days are numbered, right? That, that skill set of being able to click next is not long for this world. Because if you're just developing, a, a, a delivering a generic IT experience, that generic IT experience will be delivered by the cloud at dramatically simplified, uh, dramatically lower costs and dramatically higher service level agreements than you're able to provide. Now, on the flip side, the cloud is going to, by its nature, it's going to offer a small number of offerings at very low prices and very high SLAs. Like, when was the last time you called your cable TV company and said, you know, I, I don't like channel 32. I'd like to get rid of channel 32, right? One, I don't know, has anybody ever talked to their cable company? You know, there's, there's nobody to talk to. Uh, and you can't get specialized offerings, right? The same sort of thing's gonna happen in the cloud. This is what you get and that's it. So there is, there absolutely is room for IT pros running things on premise if it's different than just a click next, next experience. Because if it's just a click next experience, it's going to be way cheaper and way better from the cloud. But if you're actually adding value, there's a ton of value to be added. Okay? So, anyway, so I, I, I believe that, um, that, and by the way, that means PowerShell. If you're not doing PowerShell adding value, I, I don't think there's a, there's, I don't think there are many more years left. 
So for the successful, for power users, successful when successful, the syntax and consistency has been pipe, uh, uh, very successful. Object pipelining successful, adapter is successful. Um, the sliding scale of scripting, big success. Access to all the different types of APIs worked out well. The management models, the help, all that things, I think that has been very successful. However, uh, uh, coverage determines success. Okay, now we got the critical mass of coverage, but that's on PowerShell version three. And, uh, and I don't think we've done enough work on these generic uh, processing utilities, you know, like the star objects. I keep looking for a good join object, and some people have developed ones, but really we should be doing that, and, and there should be a lot more of them. And the error ha handling is very powerful, but it's also sometimes confusing. Uh, we should really should have had like a resolve error commandlet and then online to go search all the, the content for things. Um, I have one, you don't, I should share mine. Uh, debugging is a mixture of wonderful and impossible. I mean, it's great, I mean, debugging scripts, that's awesome, but then sometimes it didn't work. And so you'll see like remote debugging didn't work, uh, workflow debugging didn't work, and we're fixing those things. And there's been way too much friction in sharing artifacts. This is something I just made a mistake on. I left it up to the community, and that was great. I felt like Microsoft would screw this up. I felt that if we did script sharing, and by the way, I was very clear from the very beginning, we weren't do this, we we're not gonna do this, we're not gonna do this, because we'll screw it up. Either we'll start it, and then we'll get distracted and do something else, or we'll start it and be successful, and then some executive will like, ah, oh, let's monetize it, let's get a lot of money, let's make them use live ID or some new ID to, anyway, just screw it up. Anyway, two things happen. One was I convinced myself that Microsoft was in a better position with respect to the community, that we can engage the community constructively and, it, and, and, and with integrity and commitment. And the second is that, honestly, the, the community efforts that were out there just did not achieve the critical mass that I had hoped them to achieve. And I think that Microsoft saying, hey, we're going to deliver a solution will allow us to achieve that critical mass. So that's, that's why we're doing that work. It's also the reason why I'm gonna look out there and, and pick a test framework and say I think everybody ought to be using this. I mean, right, each one of you right now could say, hey, we should be using this framework or whatever and tell everybody else to do that, but that really hasn't happened, so I think it's a role for us. By the way, if we pick the wrong one and the community says, no, we should do X, Y, and Z, that's great. You know, uh, the community really should be driving some of that. Anyway, let me zoom through some of these, because I'll get to futures. Okay, last slide. Sorry for kind of going on. So here's what is coming up. Faster cycles. I mentioned to you that in the past we had a three-year release. Let's see, there's, it took a long time to get version one out. I don't know how long it took to get version two out, but then version three took three years. Version four took a year, and and now um, we shipped Windows. The way we used to do it is we'd innovate, we put that innovation in the next version of Windows, and then we'd make it available down level through something called the Windows Management Framework. Now we've changed. Now we're on a cloud cadence and a cloud footing. What that means is, as I innovate, I release immediately through the Windows Management Framework but I release only on the latest bits. So WMF 5, which includes PowerShell version 5, is only available on Windows Server 2012 R2 and Windows 8.1. But I'm releasing that, I released a copy at tech, at, uh, sorry, at build, and then I released another one uh, a month later. And we're gonna release that every couple months, new versions as innovation comes out. Then, we'll put it in the next major version of Windows, and then take that and make it all available down level. Okay, so we're moving much quicker. Now you notice we did the resource kit. The resource kit, DS desired state configuration, we did it as a minimal viable product. We had a very small number of, command, of resources in the first version, and then we released a resource kit. I brought the resource kit back. Anybody ever use the old resource kit? Yeah, that thing was great, but it was also misused. 
So we're using it with integrity. So what we're going to do is we're going to put things in the resource kit as kind of that like experimental zone with customers, and then it's going to get back into the product. So when we release components of the resource kit, we're putting an X in front of it. The X means experimental. It means it can break. It will have breaking changes. I promise you, I will have breaking changes, right? But that's the point, because I'm giving it to you so that you can try it and say, I don't like that. See, when I release it, and then, I, and then you say, I don't like that, I say, gee, that sucks. I wish you'd told me about that before I released it. I guess you're going to have to cope. With the X, I get to say, oh, that's a great idea. I'm going to change that. Break those guys. Sorry, but he had a better idea. We're going to do it that way. So the X means you have the ability to change the way we do it. Our, our barriers to change are very low for anything with an X in front of it. Uh, but also means don't rely on it too heavily. Okay, much better community engagement. All the stuff I mentioned and the embrace of OneGet. We embrace the chocolatey community uh, and their repository. And we're going to embrace the uh, unit test community. By the way, I actually have a list of things that I think are important for us to take a stand on. I'm going to do a few and see how we're doing and see if I'm actually moving the needle and then start working on the next. I don't want to, I want you. Afterwards, I know you're all going to come up to me and say, hey, what about this, and what about that, and what about that? But by and large, I'm thinking about them, and I got them on my whiteboard, but I want to make sure we nail these ones first. I don't want to start a, a bunch of things that are half-baked. We're going to focus more on developers and the DevOps workflow. And again, sort of now I'll talk some general philosophy here about Microsoft. This is kind of like core beliefs, and, and I always like to explain how we think about things, because then that gives you a better ability to predict what we're going to do. Now, Microsoft always has believed that people benefit with computing, and that the more computing they have, the more they benefit. Now, the clearest example of this is stuff like a, a Walmart. When Walmart started to use big data to find out what their customers were actually doing, and then use that to do dynamic inventory control and supply chain management, revolutionized their business. Incredible. But it was because they were able to use lots and lots of real-time computing. Now, we believe that as an industry, each of us is getting better and better at being able to use lots of computing to drive business advantage. Now, then we're left with the question, well, by the way, so that's one thought. The second thought is, we also believe that people are using well below their optimal level of computing for their business. So why is it that people are not using the optimal level of computing for their business? In the past, it used to be cost. The answer is friction. In the past, the friction was cost, right? Servers were expensive. So here's my budget, and I'm going to do the most I can with that budget, and then next year I'll try and get more budget, and I'll do as much good as I can with that. But these days, servers are really quite affordable. And virtual servers are cheap, and cloud servers are dirt cheap. So really, while there are still costs in the system, especially if you're still on SANS, very expensive, but in general, the costs are really quite low. But the frictions, uh, the financial friction, see some sand guys there. Okay, so the financial friction's been replaced with the mechanical friction. I stand up a new instance of Windows and click, 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 click. Oh my God, right? So what we want to do is we want to eliminate that mechanical friction of provisioning the system. So we want to minimize the effort and risk to be able to consume tons of computing, right? So eliminate that friction. That's why there's a heavy investment on desired state configuration. Desired state configuration, you say, hey, here's the way the world ought to be. Make it so. Make it so times 10. Make it so times 100. Make it so times 1,000. Boom, boom, boom. Oh, 1,000, now I want 100. No, actually, I want to go back to 1,000. So go, scale up, scale down very, very quickly. Why do I invest in the re repositories? Because when you provision Windows, you have the Windows scavenger hunt. Oh, I got the Windows. Now, where's that thing? Where's this? Where's that? Put those things in repository. Include those elements in your desired state configuration. Stand up the machine. Go out to the internet. Pull those all down. Provision the machine. When it's ready, everything that you need is right there. So that's the philosophy. That's what I'm investing in. Oh, by the way, and also, hey, how do I go from one machine to 100? 
to the degree to which I say, oh, okay, so now I've eliminated the click, click, click with a script, great, does it work? I don't know. Okay, so more click, click, click testing. Unit test framework. Test the stuff out. Hey, now deploy it, run the unit tests. If they work, boom, put it in production. So with this, I then say and it, it, that my prediction is that we're going to ultimately open source PowerShell and make it available on Linux. Now it's very important, this word. This word is a prediction. It is not, it is not a pre-disclosure. Well, let me draw the distinction. <laughs> my job is a technologist. My job is to look out at the industry, understand the forces, and make predictions so that we can then make plans. So I look at the forces and I say, hey, it is inevitable that we're going to do this. We're going to be forced to do this. This is not a, hey, I got a plan to do it. I'm going to have Joe do this, this, and this. I do not have a plan. In fact, I'm consciously not going to do this. I'll be very specific about it. I am putting all my weight, all my resources, everything I have on desired state configuration. The reality is that anything I do in this space is going to consume resources that take away from achieving critical mass on desired state configuration, and therefore I'm not going to look at it. Okay? It's not entirely true. I'll probably get an intern in, and part of the intern, I might have them go take a look at this to really scope it out, but I doubt that's going to work. So I'll just be really clear. I got to put, I got to achieve critical mass and desired state configuration. But, so how does this relate to that? And here's the thing you need to get in focus. Okay, I, I wear a couple different hats, right? I wear, um, of course, the PowerShell hat, but I wear the hat of the lead architect for Windows Server and System Center. And I also wear the hat as a distinguished engineer for Microsoft. And when I put my distinguished engineer, I take off my Windows Server hat and I put on my um, uh, Microsoft hat, then the thing I have to realize is that in an Azure context, I make more money if you buy 10 instances of, of Linux than if you buy two instances of Windows. In an Azure context, volume is far more important for making money than differentiation. Now, in other environments, differentiation is very important. So I'll always try and make Windows Server better, etc. But I need to make Windows, Linux be a fantastic uh, experience on Linux. Or sorry, I need to make Linux a fantastic experience on the Microsoft stack and in Azure in particular. And in particular, I need to eliminate any friction for you to consume tons of resources, whether it's pure Windows, pure Linux, or a mixture. And so I want to have a unified management stack to be able to consume all of it. I also, for my own purposes, need a unified management stack to manage the cloud fabric. The cloud fabric, I need to be able to manage um, the f compute, the storage, and the networking. Okay? And that's why I've invested in WMI, made that much better. I mentioned WMI v2, dramatically better than in the past. I invested in WS Man to make it the primary way you do management of Windows. DCOM is there for exist, you know, backward compatibility and why we invested in open source implementation of WMI called OMI, and we got hardware vendors to put it in their network switches, Arista, Huawei, and Cisco, and I got a bunch of others on deck to put it in there, so that I can have a single management stack to manage all the elements of the physical fabric and give you a man the same uh, management stack so you can manage all the tenants to eliminate the friction, to be able to just consume mass amounts of computing and to optimize your business. So that's, that's, that's kind of it. Any questions? <laughs> questions, comments? This, does it make any sense? Should I have talked about G instead? Okay, well, maybe we should have a, a drink and they can ask questions in a more informal fashion. Yeah? Do you want 